All right, welcome everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome to today's Year 12 Legal Studies Lecture. Um, let me get this started. All right, welcome. Thank you for joining. I know it's very warm um, right now. Hopefully you guys are in the air condition or at least a little bit cool. Um, just in case we don't know too much about ATAR notes or maybe this is your first lecture or one of the first lectures that you've been to, I'll just give you a bit of a background about who we are. So basically we're an organization um, dedicated to giving high school students and uni students free, really accessible resources especially on our website. Um, that's in the form of our notes that we give for different courses, these lectures, our forum, a whole bunch of different broad spectrum things that we offer. Um, we know that a lot of the stuff available is really costly um, and really inaccessible. So our whole kind of aim and vision is to make it really affordable, really accessible to you guys. All right, so some of the things that I was talking about, so the study notes, lectures, the online um, Q&As and forums. So we actually have um, like, yeah, forums where you can go and post maybe like a legal studies essay and ask for some feedback on that essay and ask for some help on what you could write about for an essay and things like that. And yeah, we have online graduates that will respond to you um, and you also have your peers that will respond to you. So I, I really liked the forum and I, um, I would post my essays for some feedback and for some help when I was in year 12 for legal studies, I remember. Um, we also have some videos, we have a newsletter, we have an ATAR calculator. I always say take the ATAR calculator with a grain of salt though, because obviously there are a bunch of factors um, that go into you know determining your ATAR so it, it's a good indicator but don't take it you know exactly for what it is um, we have articles in here we have heaps more we recently um, kind of refreshed our website and modernized it so there's heaps um, that you can access heaps of different resources for free that you can access there all right um, we also have TutorSmart, which is our low-cost online tutoring program where we have both classes and one-on-one -on -one private tutoring. I'll get into that a little bit later though, so don't worry too much about that for now. Um, as well as that, we also have our study guides, which are our physical textbooks, which also come with exams and practice questions. And then we also have Ed Unlimited, which is the online version of those study guides. Again, I'll go into both of those later on as well, so don't worry too much now um just it's just kind of a little bit of an intro all right so before we continue um if anyone just came from my english standard lecture i'm sorry i'm going to re be repeating myself here but i'm not going to assume that everyone came from my english standard lecture um if you do english standard and you didn't come to that lecture you will be able to access the recording on our website Okay, so for those of you that haven't met me today, I'm Chloe Lee. It's nice to meet you all. I'm sorry I can't actually see you, but you can see me. Um, these were my subjects that I did in Year 12. As I mentioned earlier today, you can tell I was definitely a big English fanatic. I definitely loved English. Um, I did legal studies, got a band six in legal studies. I loved legal studies as well. Um, a few fun facts about me. I love dogs, I love spicy food, and I recently came back from traveling all over Italy, and there are some photos from all the food I was eating in Italy, and yeah, it was a really great time. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so the game plan for today, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be having the first content block being devoted to crime revision. You guys have just come out of term one, most of you would have done crime. Um, and we need to do a little bit of revision for it. We need to refresh ourselves. Hopefully we've been doing some revision these holidays. Maybe we haven't. Nonetheless, we're going to do some revision. Okay. And then content block two, we'll be looking at essay writing and then finally exam skills. We're going to have a bit of a break in the middle. That break will be a chance for you guys to maybe get a drink, go to the bathroom, take a little break, stand up, stretch, whatever. It'll also be the time where I answer all of your questions. So below like my box, like the video, I mean to say, there's, you'll see that there's a Q and A. In that space, you can type a question. It can be completely anonymous. 
And yeah, you can write me any questions you have about legal studies or about HSC in general, or even about uni, anything at all. As I said, it's completely anonymous. Um, and you can write a question about stuff as I'm going through. Maybe you'll get a question or maybe you have questions that, you know, you already want answered. Um, that will be specifically answered during our Q&A time during our break. After the lecture, if I have time, I will also pick up on some of those questions. I'll answer them in order of most liked to least liked. So if you see a question that you want to ask that's already been asked, obviously don't re-ask it, just like the one that's already been asked. Or if you see a question that you think, yeah, I really want to know the answer to that, actually like it so I know I need to answer it. Um, please remember, this is the big thing, what you get from this lecture is up to you, all right? You can use this time as poorly or as well as you like. If you have a question or if I'm if I'm trying to explain something and something's just not clicking, ask a question, okay? Ask it. Otherwise, you're just going to sit there confused, all right? So you get what, what you can out of this lecture. Um, yeah, ask any question. Remember, it's anonymous, right? So... You can, you don't have to tell me who you are. All right. Oh, it cut off some of the writing. Um, I do have a poll. Now, where you'll see the Q&A box on the right, you'll see it says polls. If you want to click on that, I'm going to activate. Sorry, if you see me looking over here, it's because this is where my laptop is with the polls where I can activate it. And I want to know how are we feeling towards legal studies? Are we feeling one, two, three, four, five, six? Those of you that came from English Standard, this is a bit familiar. I just want to kind of get a general gist of how we're all feeling. Do we like legal studies? Is it a bit challenging? Where are we kind of falling? I'll give you guys a minute because uh, I know, I think I'm, or you're, like the video is delayed a few minutes, like one minute or two minutes. Um, okay, we're mostly five. That's good. That's really good. Five followed up by four. Oh my gosh, it was like that in English Standard. People wanted to beat up English, understandably though. People want to beat up legal. I get that. Six. Yeah, I get that as well. Uh, it is what it is. Four, but five is the resounding answer, which is good. That feels really good. We have some twos, which is even better. Um, actually, I can't tell who's more enthusiastic, two or five, but good, <laughs> good that we have some of those, some threes, some ones, but mostly fives. I'll give you guys like a minute more. That's hilarious. That's good. Though. It's, it's good to see it's five. It's just, there's, of course, there's the fours. I think at my point in year 12, like if I were in your position again, I probably would have chosen four as well. I probably wouldn't have beat up legal studies. It's definitely um, full on, but that's okay. But five, five seems to be the consensus. That's great, awesome. All right, I'll stop that there then. Um, that's good, that gives me a little bit of an indicator of where we are um, with legal studies. All right, let's start the first content block. Um, oh yes, exam revision, sorry. I didn't mention this in the lesson breakdown, I'm not sure why. What we're gonna do now is exam revision of the first half of crime because I'm not going to revise all of crime because I would need you know a couple of days to do that so I thought we'll do some multiple choice to do some revision of the first half of crime and then for the second half of crime the part that people usually don't spend as much time on and the part that people usually forget in my experience with marking we'll do the in-depth review and revision okay so first question who is and let me sorry okay who is responsible for determining a verdict in a criminal trial? Answer down below. The magistrate, the judge, the jury, the defense counsel. Who do we think? Got one answer so far. Okay. I'll give you guys um, a bit of time because again, I think it's a little bit delayed. Okay, we've got a mix. I won't say yet for the people that haven't responded. A bit of a mix, okay. I'll wait for everyone, I'll give you guys a minute. All 
All right, cool. I think I'm going to, oh, interesting. It's telling me more people have submitted an answer than are watching. I don't know how that's possible. Anyways, um, let's stop that. I'll stop that. The biggest group was C, which is good because it's the correct answer. And let me explain why. The, the other big group was, it was between the jury and the judge. The jury is the one that has to determine whether or not beyond a reasonable doubt, okay, remember that, beyond a reasonable doubt, in a criminal trial, whether or not they find the defendant guilty or not guilty. Remember, it's not guilty or innocent because we don't necessarily know that um, they're innocent. We just know that there wasn't enough evidence to indict them. Um, but yeah, they're the ones coming up. Do we believe that they're, uh, they're guilty or not guilty? That's the jury's decision, right? That's the verdict. The verdict is we, the jury, believe that the person is guilty or not guilty. All right. That's the jury's responsibility. The judge doesn't have any say in the verdict. The judge is important for the sentencing. The judge is the one that determines the sentencing for the offender. Remember those mitigating um, and aggravating factors. If we can remember that mitigating be being things that can weaken or lessen your sentence and then aggravating things that worsen your sentence. So showing remorse for the um, victim would be a mitigating factor. Aggravating would be showing no remorse. All right. That's the judge's responsibility, everything about the sentencing. They're supposed to interpret the law and say, hmm, based on the law, this sentence is the most suitable for you. Okay. All right. Second question. Let me activate the poll. What is the role of the director of public prosecutions to appoint defense barristers, to assign a judge to hear a case, to appoint a jury for a trial of an accused person, to review the charges against an accused person? What do we think? Give you guys a few minutes again. Okay, so far we have 100%. Oh, nope, the mix is coming through. Okay, but we still have a resounding main answer that people uh, think. Process of elimination, people. Work backwards. Don't just pick the answer you think sounds good. Pick the worst answer and then the second worst answer, the third worst answer, and check if that best answer is actually the best. Remember asking questions if you have any. So if there's anything I haven't... Um, broke down based off the last question, please ask me. All right, I'll give you like two more minutes. Cool. Okay. Actually, I think I might stop it now. All right. So most people said D. Um, some people said B. The answer is D. All right, and even if we didn't know that that was the answer, let's work backwards, as I was just saying, the process of elimination. Does the DPP, right, the Director of Public Prosecutions, do they actually appoint defense barristers? Well, no. The defense barrister represents the defendant, right, the person who is on trial, uh, may be guilty or may be not guilty. They, it is their responsibility to organize their own defense counsel. Remember, that's a terminology we like to use, defense counsel. In some cases, if they meet um, the test relevant, they can receive legal aid. But apart from that, it's their responsibility to organize their barristers, right, and the defense counsel. So, no, it can't be A. To assign a judge, no, that has nothing to do with the DPP, okay? That's that's a crown thing, that's a state thing. That's something that has nothing to do with the DPP, who we know is independent of the state, okay? It represents the state, but independent of the state. Um, it can't appoint a jury because that would mean that they were biased, because think about it. If you're the DPP and you're trying to convict someone of a crime, you're trying to prove that they're guilty, you're gonna pick 
the jury that is going to most likely sway in your favor. Okay, you're going to be biased. So it can't be C. So that leaves us with D. Well, let's have a read. To review the charges against an accused person. Well, yeah, they are reviewing the charges because they will then take the action to try and prosecute them. Okay, so even if we didn't necessarily know that's the role of the DPP, just by simply working backwards, we can kind of ascertain that answer. All right, which type of hearing establishes if there is a prima facie case? Appeal, committal, coronial, summary. Okay, interesting to see. Very interested to see the answers here. What do we think? Give you guys a few minutes. Oh, okay, we started to get some answers in. Okay, again, we have one resounding answer. That's good. We have a bit of a mix though between A, B, or A, C, and D. B seems to be the number one. Oh, not anymore. It's okay. No, it's still coming back. <laughs> All right. Give you guys a few seconds. All right, I'm going to stop it there. So most of us said committal. That's true. This is just really um, memorization. This remember a committal hearing isn't trying to find out if they're guilty or not guilty. It's really a judge and a DPP looking at it. Well, magistrate, sorry, and a DPP looking at all the facts of the case and the evidence and saying, is there enough for a possible conviction? Could we actually convict this offender? Because if there's not enough for a conviction, there's no point in having a trial. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of effort, emotional effort. There's no point. All right. So prima facie on the face of the evidence. Okay. That's what that means. Occurs um, that that process occurs during a committal hearing. Can we commit them? Can we actually find them guilty? Is there enough evidence that a jury would find them beyond reasonable doubt guilty of the crime? All right, next question. Which of the following can be used as a partial defense? Accident, insanity, necessity, self-defense. What do we think? All right, I'll wait for some answers. Oh, we're starting to get some. Bit of a mix. I think these are the ones that students always forget about. Okay. Give you guys a few minutes. And I see the Q&A's um, filling up with questions, so that's really good. All right. Okay. I might stop it here. Self-defense. Good. This is another um, kind of just simple memorization um, question. I will say when you are studying the content in your revision, especially for crime, this area of the syllabus pay particular attention to because they love to make multiple choice questions about this. What is a complete defense? What can reduce a sentence down from murder to manslaughter? What is a partial defense? All those, it's really good that you know the difference. Okay, so I would, if I were you, maybe jot down on a sticky note or something, whatever, revise partial and complete defenses to a crime. That area of the syllabus, we, we definitely need to know. Okay, which of the following, this is our second last question, which of the, f oh no, our last question, I think. 
I can't move forward because I will tell you the answer. But which of the following is correct about a person's right to legal aid when on trial for a serious indictable offense? A, all accused persons have the right to legal aid. B, the right to legal aid is only available in the Supreme Court. C, defendants only have the right to legal aid if they plead guilty. D, a person has the right to legal aid if an injustice is likely to occur. What do we think? Give you guys a few minutes to answer that one as well. This is great practice, um, by the way, for crime, because these areas of the syllabus, you obviously can't talk about an extended response for your crime essay. Can't really talk about the nature of crime. You're mostly going to be asked about it through multiple choice. Okay, so I would suggest doing these multiple choice questions um, as prep for when in your trials in HSC when you'll be asked about them. Because now, unless you, because I know some schools do human rights first and then crime, unless that's you, you will only ever be asked about crime again in the form of an exam. Okay, so it's important that you approach it that way. Um, how are we going? Okay, most of us are saying A followed by D. Cool, I'll give you guys a second to do that. Remember the Q&A, when we get into the content, when we start doing some revision, um, I would suggest to really have that Q&A up and remember to ask questions. Okay, cool, I'm gonna stop that. Most of us said A or D. The answer is D because it is not true that everyone has the right to legal aid. If I'm a millionaire, I wish I was, let's say I have, you know, $28 million in the ideal world. I don't have the right to legal aid because it's unfair. There could be someone else who has very little money that can't afford to represent themselves in court, but I want the legal aid. Can you see how that might be an injustice? It's, it's unfair that I would have the right to legal aid. So it's, it's not a right, it's considered a privilege, okay? Not everyone just automatically gets the right to legal aid um, for a number of reasons. For example, that, that's one reason if you are above the um, wage threshold, if I make too much money, because remember, we legal aid receives very little funding, which is something you could talk about in your essays. Um, so they need to really prioritize who they're giving it to. They they don't have you know, an abundance of public lawyers that they can just give out and say, all right, everyone gets legal aid. They need to prioritize the people with the lowest level of income that can't literally can't afford a barrister or a defense counsel of their own. As well as that, you will be denied legal aid if the evidence is very strongly not in your favor. For example, let's say I go rob a bank and there's the evidence of my fingerprints all over the crime scene and they literally have the CCT footage of my face in the bank robbing them, I will likely be denied legal aid because there's no point of legal aid. You're, you're most likely going to be found guilty, okay? The reason why we give legal aid, the number one reason, is if an injustice is likely to occur, okay? So um, indigenous people, unfortunately, we know they they suffer from injustices all the time. So indigenous people are favored for legal aid for that reason. Um, yeah, we, we really, again, are prioritizing. And that can transfer into a, a body paragraph, right? If you wanna talk about legal aid for a body paragraph, those are many dot points you can talk about how it's effective because it prioritized, but also it doesn't offer it to everyone, right? It's a privilege, not a right. It's considered a privilege, not a right. All right, last one then. Oh, okay, I have 10. I might skip through the next three because I do wanna to get to the content. This will be our last one. All right, a person, let me start the poll. A person is arrested for a serious crime. He exercises his right to remain silent before the trial. However, at his trial, he gives evidence that he was not at the crime scene. Which of the following is true? The judge can instruct the jury that this evidence may not be reliable. The prosecution cannot cross-examine the accused on this new evidence. The jury can ask the accused why he did not raise this evidence earlier. The accused does not have the right to raise this evidence during the trial. Again, if we're a bit stuck, process of elimination. Which seems the least plausible and what seems the most plausible? 
Oh, okay, we've got some answers flowing in. Nice. All right, bit of a mix on this one, bit of a mix. Okay. All right, I'll just wait until more people answer. Yeah, we've got a bit of a mix on this one. More of a mix than last time. Or in our last questions, I mean to say. But still, we have one resounding answer that everyone thinks. Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds. All right, let's stop it there. Okay, answer is A, and most of us said A. The reason why it's A is because Anything that you don't say or do say can be held against you when you're arrested, okay? Everyone is really familiar with that phrase, anything you say may or may not be used against you in a court of law. That phrase means that, yes, anything you say, such as I committed the crime, can be used against you, but also anything you don't say can be used against you. So. If all of a sudden you are justifying everything that happened and, oh, really, but it was just this and this was the actual truth that happened, the DPP can come and ask you, why didn't you say this at the time of arrest? Why is this suddenly coming up now? Is this something that is, is this, could this be um, not completely factual? It, they can accuse you of that, um, stuff like that. So the judge has the right to instruct the jury that it might, may not be reliable because of that. All right. Because it can, it can be seen as something that's been made up after the fact. So remember anything you say can be used against you, but also anything you don't say can be used against you. All right. We won't do those, but if we come back, we'll do those um, at the end if we have time. Let's get into sentencing and punishment, all right? As I said, I'm focusing on areas of the syllabus that um, people, it's not their best um, compared to the first half of the syllabus. I'm not sure if it's because the first half of the syllabus, we're still eager to learn and we're ready, and then by the second half, legal studies starts to drown us in content and we start to kind of, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not sure, but nonetheless, let's go through it. So sentencing and punishment. You need to know the main act for sentencing and punishment is Crime Sentencing and Procedure Act 1999 in New South Wales. That is your holy grail, okay? That is where we have the statutory and judicial guidelines for sentencing. We have all different, um, we have the purposes for punishment. Um, we have mandatory sentences. We have everything under that act, okay? It's the main act you must know for sentencing and punishment. All right, let's go through statutory and judicial guidelines. What are judicial guidelines? Well, the guidelines, which basically, I don't want to say guide, but assist judges in sentencing decisions, okay? Um, it comes from seminal or really important judges from the New South Wales Court of Criminal Appeal. Okay, and yeah, it's decisions in sentencing which help other judges with similar cases come up with a sentence. So let's say I have someone who, I don't know, assaulted another person and I'm unsure, I'm a judge and I'm unsure of the sentence to give them. I can refer to other cases where similar things have happened, where there were assault cases that were similar and the sentences that they got. Okay, and I can basically base my decision off those similar sentences and use that to inform, all right, I'm going to give this person the same sentence that those judges gave them. This helps with consistency. Um, and yeah, the, the main thing is that it helps with consistency. So people can't be like, I assaulted someone and I got 12 years. They assaulted someone and they got three months. That's not fair. So it helps it be fair and consistent. 
Um, all right, so judges read cases and pick the best examples of sentencing decisions, which therefore form judicial guidelines for the judge. The aim is consistency. As I said, the process needs to be predictable. You need to be able to say, all right, I assaulted someone, I'm going to get this amount of time. Okay, it's not just like, oh, three months, three years, 12 years, it can't just be random and arbitrary. There are eight judicial guidelines. For example, when someone pleads guilty to armed robbery, judges may wish to follow the guidelines from R vs. Henry 1999. Okay, however, the big thing here is that it's a judicial guideline. It's not a judicial rule or they must follow it. Me as a judge, let's say I'm a judge, I can choose to base my sentencing decision off those similar cases. I don't have to. So I have what's called discretion. Just in case we're not aware of what discretion is, discretion is choice, okay? I have the discretion, I have the choice to base my sentencing decision off those cases, or really I could say 13 years, even though it's usually three months, I'm gonna give you 13 years. Now that might be appealed and they might fight that sentence, but that's not the point I'm trying to make here. The point I'm trying to make is I have discretion as a judge even though there are judicial guidelines. However, in saying that, is it's very rare that a judge is gonna do something like that, okay? Because they wanna create consistency. Um, it's, it's better for the whole legal system overall. Statutory guidelines are very similar, but they're acts, okay? They're pieces of legislation which basically delegate for this crime, you want around this sentence. For this crime, someone should receive around this sentence. It's the same sort of thing. It's a guideline, right? Um, there are a number of acts of parliament. There are a number of acts of parliament that they may wish or have to follow. We'll get into that in a second. So the Crime Sentencing Procedure Act 1999, New South Wales, is the primary sources source of sentencing law. Gosh, sorry. Um, and and in that within that act, you have statutory guidelines. Standard non-parole periods for some crimes were introduced within that act that was amended in 2003. So just in case we don't know what a standard um, non-parole period is, SNPP, it is the period um, of a person's sentence that they can't be released on parole. Parole is the conditional release of someone who was serving a prison sentence out into the community, of course, as I said, on those conditions. So if I'm in prison and I've been really good and I haven't started any fights or riots or anything, I can be released in parole and my conditions are maybe that I can't leave the house, I need to check in with my uh, correctional officer every week um, and I have to wear an ankle monitor. Let's say those are my conditions. That's parole. A standard non-parole period then is a period of which um, of your sentence you can't leave. You can't get parole. Okay. And that's a part of statutory guidelines because judges will look at that in your sentence and say, all right, three years and you have a standard non-parole period of, let's see what the law says, two years. Yeah, that's fair. Two years. Okay. That's what they do. Um, some crimes have a maximum and a standard non-parole period. So for example, armed robbery has a 25 years max sentence that you can receive and a standard non-parole period of seven years. So speaking of which, police, office, uh, police are going past my house right now. Um, so armed robbery, for example, so statutory guidelines don't always have to be the um, minimum that, they, that you can receive for doing a certain crime they can also be the maximum. So a judge can't give more than 25 years for armed robbery. All right, mandatory sentencing. This is very different, okay? Because the discretion that we had, remember the choice of the judges that we had in judicial guidelines and statutory guidelines has now been completely obliterated. We don't have that anymore as a judge. Imagine you're a judge, you have no discretion here. You must sentence what the act says. So. Crimes Act 1900 New South Wales was a catalyst for change. Um, the big mandatory sentence is for the death of a police officer, okay? If you kill a police officer, there's a mandatory sentence that you will get. As a judge, I have, let's say I'm a judge, I this person murdered a police officer, I can't say, I have no opinion over what sentence I'll get they'll get the mandatory sentence, okay? Discretion has been removed. Now, the big issue with this, 
and why you would want to talk about this in an essay, hint, hint, I would pay attention, is because it doesn't take into account any aggravating or mitigating factors. And we know that they were designed to help keep justice, okay, or um, achieve justice. So for example, if the person was six, uh, let's say 18, killed the police officer, so they're very young, and then they're crying in court, and they're talking about how they've gone through, you know, deep mental issues because of this, and they're showing great re uh, remorse, they will receive the exact same sentence as someone who is happy about what they did, couldn't care less, and has no worries about it, okay? That's an injustice because obviously there's two different offenders there. One person who seems as though they may not um, offend again or, you know, is, is happy to get rehabilitated and stop offending, and the other person who, as I said, couldn't care less, right? wants to keep offending they will receive the exact same sentence which is an injustice so when you're talking about sentencing punishment mandatory sentencing bing 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 i would definitely talk about it because there's a big injustice issue there on the one hand with something like the death of a police officer we want to protect police officers we want them to have their authority because then you know we have complete anarchy and everyone's just running amok but on the other hand we want justice for these offenders, which we don't get with mandatory sentencing. Um, and in the media, high incidences of drunk disorderly behavior and violent crimes fueled by alcohol in the community. So the one punch laws also have mandatory sentencing. So I don't know if you guys, yeah, yeah I think you guys should remember the one punch laws um, when King's Cross in Sydney was like in its heyday, it, um, we used to have people, um, it's also called the coward punch where people come up and um, punch other people from behind and they don't see it coming and then we had some deaths from it. Hopefully we remember the death of Thomas Kelly as a key case in legal studies. If we don't, Thomas Kelly was killed by one punch um, by Loveridge, okay? Arvis Loveridge, we need to remember that. Loveridge came up, punched him from behind, he died because of that. Um, because of the media outrage toward this and saying that Kelly shouldn't have, like, there should be a really harsh penalty on Loveridge, we introduced mandatory sentencing for anyone that does a one punch um, to someone and kills them. Okay, so mandatory sentencing there again. On one hand, it was satisfying the community because the community was really outraged and wanted tough penalties. On the other hand, for the offender, remember, we're balancing the rights of victims, offender, and society. For the offender, again, those aggravating, mitigating factors, we threw them out the window. All right, this is what I was talking about for the police officers. This is the act that um, you, you can reference if you're talking about this in an essay. Um, you receive a life sentence. Uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't say that earlier, but you receive a life sentence if you murder a police officer. Um, again, there's no judicial discretion. The key case um, that we see this in is R versus Jacobs. 2013. Jacobs received a life sentence for the murder of a police officer. So in a paragraph, that's a key case you could look at. Um, this, as I said, creates serious justice issues, right? It's an injustice for the offender. The key case that is still printed in my mind from when I studied legal studies is Sydney Morning Herald 2011, is a policeman's life worth more? Okay, that's basically a media case where the um, journalist discusses the fact that, yes, we need police officers to have their authority and we need people to respect them. But on the other hand, is it more than any other person that gets murdered? Because if any other person on the street gets murdered who's not a police officer, who's to say that their offender, the person who killed them, will get a life sentence? They won't. So there's another justice issue. We're not sure, um, you know, the question, is, is a policeman's life worth more? Um, parliament is also, another thing you could talk about is parliament is taking over the role of courts. Okay, this is another issue with mandatory sentencing. We remember, if we can, the separation of powers. We separate the parliament and the judiciary or the courts, okay? Meaning that the parliament, in theory, shouldn't be able to have any say over the judiciary or the courts, okay? Vice versa. The judge shouldn't be able to come out and start doing what the parliament should be doing. 
that is what we want, right? That creates a check and balance, meaning that if a parliament's doing something wrong, the judge can come out and criticize it, and then vice versa. If the if the judge is doing something wrong, parliament can come out and um, criticize it. Both can criticize each other, okay? Um, and the executive all can criticize each other, police force, judge, and parliament. Now, if we have the parliament saying to the judge, nope, you have no choice in the sentencing. I'm going to say that you have to give him the life sentence. You can see that's pretty much silencing the judge. It's pretty much the parliament doing the role of the judiciary, right? So that separation of powers that we, we love and is good for the justice is starting to be impeached. So that's another thing. Not only do we have the, um, uh, the injustice of the offender who may or may not receive, you know, as we're talking about aggravating mitigating factors not being considered. We also have people outraged about similar crimes done to different people and not receiving as harsh a penalty, such as is a policeman's life worth more? And then we also have the issue of the impeachment on the separation of, sorry, the impeachment of the separation of powers. So there's a lot to talk about here. You could try and talk about them in um, one body paragraph. I, however, think it would be more suitable to only talk about one of those issues per body paragraph. Trying to talk about all of it together and trying to fit in all your evidence might be a bit too much. So maybe choose one or two of them to do together. Okay, and then yeah, there's another piece of, um, uh, there's a newspaper article that you could use where it talks about that judicial discretion being um, overtaken and the separation of powers being disrupted. Okay, this is for what I was talking about before. Um, this is for one punch laws, okay? The Crimes and Other Amendment Assault and Intoxication Act. Arvis Loveridge 2013, as I said, um, it was, yeah, it was initially, um, there was a lot of outrage because he received four years for a life. Um, or four years, yeah, it should say four years for a life. Sorry, I don't know why it says four, year, four years of life. Um, yeah, he, he initially received four years, but there was outrage and then it was re increased to seven years on appeal by the DPP. Okay, um, so now there's a mandatory minimum sentence of eight years. Okay, again, as I said, there's no mitigating factors and no judicial discretion. All right, R versus Garth 2017 was the first case where we saw this law um, be implemented in an actual case okay so Garth was um, convicted of under the one punch laws and received eight years okay um, with a standard non pro period sorry 10 years with a standard non pro period of eight years as per this legislation um, okay so that's all about mandatory sentencing and statutory and judicial guidelines. If I, I'm not gonna sway your p uh, position on this, but here's something to think about. Statutory and judicial guidelines can be good because they give the judge an idea and help inform them on what might be a good decision for sentencing, but they also empower the judge to think about the mitigating and aggravating factors, okay? So there's that discretion there. There's also the protection of the separation of powers. There are statutory guidelines, Parliament saying, hey, this is something you could do, but we respect that you have the choice. However, as we just said, mandatory sentencing, that's abolished. Okay, now we're moving on to the purpose of punishment. These are all the different purposes of punishment. Um, so to ensure that the offender is adequately punished for the offense, to prevent crime by deterring the offender and other persons from committing similar offenses. Remember that's specific deterrence and um, collective or communal deterrence uh, to, or general deterrence also. To protect the community from the offender, to promote the rehabilitation of the offender, to make the offender accountable for his or her actions, to denounce the conduct of the offense, to recognize the harm done to the victim of the crime in the community. Now, judges will usually state or reference one of these, actually not one, multiple of these reasons in their sentencing. Um, they will likely reference like, th this is the justification for my sentence. Um, this is why I've done this. This is really important if you have a case where the judge has considered mitigating factors, meaning the judge has lowered the sentence because the person has showed remorse or because the person's young. Well, this is their first offense. 
or because the person's an elderly person. All those mitigating factors may reduce a sentence. And so it's important that we hear the justification of the judge that this is why, this is my actual purpose for punishment. No, it's not really to, you know, ensure the offender is adequately punished. It's more so to promote the rehabilitation of the offender. All right, deterrence. As I said, two types of deterrence. Remember, as a solid definition of deterrence, it's to discourage people from committing the same crime. Best example I can give you um, is if you're sitting in your class, think you're in legal studies, just imagine sitting in class, you hear that you have a sub that day, you have a substitute teacher, your teacher's not coming in. You think, oh, sick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on my phone, I'm gonna relax, I'm gonna watch some TikTok. You're going on your phone, you're waiting for the substitute teacher to arrive, you relax. Imagine I walk in as a substitute teacher and I'm really angry for some reason and I see your friend on their phone and I scream at them, I say, get off your phone, you're gonna get a detention. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna continue going on your phone and relax or are you gonna, okay, well, let me start doing my work. You're gonna start doing your work, okay? You're, that's deterrence. I've deterred you from not committing a crime but misbehaving or going on your phone. I've made you start doing your work, okay? Specifically, that's general deterrence. I'm trying to scare everyone into not going on their phone. Just like when I, let's say I'm a judge, give someone a harsh penalty, I'm trying to make them not, um, or everyone else in the community not commit the same crime. Specific deterrence is punishing the individual in a way that would discourage them from doing it again. So the sentence is really tailored to them and maybe that they can't see a particular person or they can't leave their house or some sort of condition in their sentence that makes them never want to commit the crime again. Okay, so there's two types of deterrence. Retribution is that um, the sentence should be morally right or deserved, appreciating the nature of the crime. So revenge, the big thing is revenge. An eye for an eye, you commit the crime, you should serve the time. We're gonna breeze through these because I want to get back to the essay stuff, the beefy stuff you can talk about. Um, rehabilitation, hopefully we all know what rehabilitation is. If we don't, it's basically to reform or help the offender so that they stop committing the crime. Rehabilitation is really, you really have to look at the social, um, social factors that contribute to crime. Okay, so why you need to understand why is this offender committing crime? You can't just talk to them and say, hey, don't commit crime. You need to understand maybe they're committing crime because they don't have an education and therefore they can't find work and therefore they need to, you know, steal and rob and whatever. Maybe because they grew up around crime and it's what's normal to them. Maybe they have a disability and they don't understand. You need to understand the factors of crime to really rehabilitate someone. So in sentencing, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to steer someone toward help to help them tackle what's really motivating them to commit crime. Um, so an example of that is the alcohol merit program for um, people who suffer from alcohol abuse um, to try and rehabilitate them and you know help them end that alcohol abuse so that they don't commit crime um, because that can be a driver for crime, alcohol and drug abuse. Nonviolent drug offenders must participate in a rehabilitation in rehabilitation in combination with probation rather than submitting to incarceration. So the drug court isn't for people who were trafficking drugs or were dealing drugs. It's for people who um, abuse drugs. Okay. And their sentences are really not tailored to retribution and revenge, really towards rehabilitation. How can we get this person off these um, illicit substances and therefore help them stop the crime? It is effective because it's reduced recidivism. Okay, remember that word recidivism. We don't want to say reoffending. We want to say recidivism. Okay, it's reduced reoffending or recidivism by 37%, which is staggering. Incapacitation, this is um, literally arresting someone, okay? Keeping them inca incapacitated, um, not just in the form of imprisonment, but also not letting them do something like leave their house, not have their license, um, imprisonment, and be forced to do community work. Um, Matthew Millat, 
we all know the Malak case was given a minimum non parole period of 30 years for murder with his of his friend with an axe. During sentences, the judge said that he remained a serious threat because he had no remorse and seemed to enjoy being known as a murderer. He had little motive for doing the killing. So it wasn't it was a combination of retribution, but also we incapacitated Milat. Um, OK, moving on to the role of the victim in sentencing. This is really important because now we're getting back to that beefy stuff. Remember. The judge doesn't sentence for the victim, but for the community. So we see a lot of the time in the paper, on the news, or on social media, the, the victim's family or the victim themselves standing in front of the court saying, an injustice was done today, my family, you know, are hurt. That may be true, but the judge needs to focus on the community and what's best for the community as opposed to the victim. That's something that's always kind of misconceived, but remember, it's for the community. Um, victims of crimes do have rights under the New South Wales Charter of Victim Rights. Victims and their families prepare and present a victim impact statement, VIS. Okay, here's where your judgment comes into play because what I'm about to say here, really, I don't want to sway your opinion again, but there's some interesting things about victims' rights. So, victim impact statements, let's look at, let's look at those. Um, they're, they're, they exist under the Crime Sentencing Procedure Act 1999 um, and they're heard during sentencing, okay? They're not heard before sentencing. They're only heard if there's been a guilty verdict that the jury's decided and all right, we're in sentencing now. The victim won't get up in front of the jury and start talking about, um, you know, the emotional and physical distress that they've suffered at the hands of the offender or the victim's family. That won't happen. Only it happens in sentencing. Um, the victim impact statement outlines how they've been affected emotionally, financially, physically, mentally by the criminal activity that happened to them. Um, the reason it gives the victim an opportunity to be heard. Now, gives them an opportunity to be heard, but a lot of the time it doesn't really carry much weight because the judge, again, doesn't sentence for the victim, but for the community. So in the face of the victim impact statement, hearing it, seeing it, whatever, the judge can still decide to go forward with the sentence that's not in the interest of the victim. OK, so it almost sometimes it feels like the, the court is just saying to the victim, yeah, yeah, have your say. Come on. All right, done. All right. Anyways, that's sometimes what it can feel like, especially when the judge is focused on rehabilitation, because obviously that's going to upset the victim and the victim's family. Now, victim impact statements must be disclosed to defense prior to being tendered in court as there is an opportunity for it to be cross-examined. In 2008, the law allowed for certain victims to give victim impact statements via CCTV and recently on Zoom, um, obviously because COVID and just the convenience with that. Liam Knight gave a victim impact statement after injuries from head injuries. Catherine Smith gave a victim impact statement in regard to the effect of 30 years of domestic violence. Now, why am I telling you this? Because if you're writing an essay about the role of the role of the victim in sentencing, those are two great examples that you could talk about. If you want to talk about how it's good because it provides victims with a voice and allows them to feel like they're heard and it empowers them, I would be jotting down these names straight away. OK, prior to 2014, only the primary victim could give a victim impact statement. Um, this is true. However, now family members who are also affected can give a victim impact statement. Family of homicide victims could read out a victim impact statement, but couldn't be taken into consideration during sentencing. However, now they can. But the question is, is it? Do we always um, see that? It was a catalyst for change as the Kelly family were devastated when the judge couldn't take into account the victim impact statement while Loveridge used character references to reduce his sentence. OK, that reform that happened um, was as a result of the Kelly case. OK, so we can now consider under this piece of legislation a family victim impact statement in homicide cases which obviously is really important because the main victim in that crime is deceased. So only the family stand to, you know, kind of voice their pain um, was used in all these cases here. Robert Z is a really seminal, important case to remember. I would also be jotting these down. 
Um, victim groups such as vocal will welcome the new laws as they can lead to an increased sentence sometimes allows the victim's family to be involved in the justice system by letting the court know how the crime has affected them. However, there is no universal acceptance of reform. Okay. As I said, it can be considered and it can increase the sentence, which, you know, will be great for the victim, but it can also not. Okay. And more often than not, it's not considered. And we see all the time in the news, right? We see the families standing in front of the court unhappy about what happened. Okay, so these are all the different types of penalties. I'm going to breeze through this part because, again, this is hopefully we all are really familiar with the different types of penalties you can receive now. Um, yeah, I'm going to breeze through. Um, all right, Crime Sentencing Procedure Act 1999 shows respect to the sentencing options available to courts for persons found guilty of offences. So all those basically exist under those, that piece of legislation. The penalty given most is a fine with 35% and a bond 33%. Penalties under this law include home detention orders, community service orders, good behaviour bonds with criminal convictions, suspended sentences and good behaviour bonds without convictions. All right, here we have a 2017 amendment where we introduce new penalties, um, including conditional release orders, which replace good behaviour bonds without convictions, um, intensive correction orders, which replace suspended sentences, um, home detention and existing ICOs. So we had older intensive correction orders, but we replaced it and kind of in instead of having multiple things, we just kind of brought it into one and community service orders, which was replaced with um, good behavior, sorry, replaced other community service orders and good behavior bonds. All right. Tough and Smart Justice Reforms 2017-18. to 18. This was a catalyst for change as it was an attempt to reduce recidivism, improve community safety and support victims. The strongest sentencing laws, okay, um, were introduced to make the community safer, yes, and were also introduced um, because of uh, voting, elections, yes, election time, and we love to hear our Prime Minister and our state representatives and everyone stand up there and say i'm going to be tough on crime i'm not going to let time, uh, crime slip through the cracks i'm going to protect our community okay so that's also why it came in um it introduced the option of increased supervision of offenders released into the community and there will be a presumption that domestic violence offenders will either receive a supervised community-based sentence or will be automatically imprisoned, which was good. So if I were you, I could talk about this four um, types of penalties and talk about the protection of the victim and society, particularly domestic violence victims and society, okay? So you could talk about the tough and smart justice reforms and its effectiveness for domestic violence victims and society because they will be more supervised and more monitored and or sorry or just automatically imprisoned okay post sentencing considerations we should be bing 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 again because there's a lot to talk about here as well so Security considerations um, after you sentenced obviously depends on the risk and the severity of the crime and your likelihood of rehabilitation. So if you're someone that um, gave police information on another offender so that you could reduce your sentence, you will have security considerations. Okay, do you need more protection? Do you need to be placed in a certain area of the prison? That kind of stuff um, for your safety. Protective custody, this is a type of security consideration. It's a separate area of the prison. It's a type of segregation from other offenders for the protection of offenders who are vulnerable to attack. And correctional authorities, sorry, correctional authorities have a duty of care for the offenders. Um, so the type of prisoners who are vulnerable to attack would be police officers. Um, the people I was just talking about, people who have given information on other offenders to reduce their sentence, um, and people with particularly um, violent crimes, especially crimes against women or children. Um, it restricts opportunities for those in custody to work and access education programs, because obviously to be able to work and 
be involved in the education programs offered to offenders, you need to be able to work together and work with other offenders, which isn't the case here. Parole, okay, this is the big one, parole. Parole, as I said, is a conditional release of a prisoner from custody after the completion of their minimum non-parole period. So with um, Loveridge, he had a 10 year sentence, eight years non-parole. If he was fine and didn't he didn't attack anyone and wasn't violent in those eight years, after eight years, he can be released on parole. The aim is to reintegrate them into the community smoothly and ensure they will not reoffend and reduce recidivism. Okay, so um, yeah, to try and reintegrate them slowly back into the community. There's likely conditions, right? Because it's a conditional release. So let's say Loveridge won't be able to leave his house. He won't be able to not check in with the correctional officer. He has to check in with the correctional officer. All that is or it still incapacitates him in a way but it's still also helping him reintegrate back into the community because he's outside of prison it encourages prisoners to behave whilst in prison and undertake rehabilitative activities um if you're released on parole you're known as a parolee parolee is under direct supervision of a parole officer because you're technically still serving jail time now the big issue with parole is that people who are parolees or well, amongst parolees we see high rates of recidivism okay so on one hand the aim of it is to reduce recidivism by reintegrating them back into community and um, getting them adjusted to society again but in practice there are high rates of recidivism we see them reoffending really quickly. A, a lot of them breach their conditions of release. Okay. If I wanted to talk about that in an essay, I would definitely jot it down. Jewel Mega is a great case. Okay. Well, it's a sad case, but great to use in legal studies. Um, Bailey, Arvis Bailey, 2014, I believe it is 2014. Um, he was on parole for being a serial sex offender when he murdered um, Jill Mega. Okay, so that's a, again, not a great case, very sad case, but a good case to look at in legal studies. Preventative detention, another one that's great to look at, okay? Preventative detention. So there's two types of preventative detention, but both are controversial. So preventative detention is where we um, imprison someone, incapacitate them before they've committed a crime. So let's look at the two different types. So there's Terrorism Police Powers Act of 2016 New South Wales, which allows people, police, sorry, not people, allows the police to detain and question suspects up to 14 days without charge. Okay. We can hold them or incapacitate them for 14 days without a charge. The issue is that it reduces, infringes the rights of individuals, even more so the big principle here, because remember in legal studies, in our essays, we like to bring it back to our legal principles. Okay. The principle of um, being innocent until proven guilty. Okay. The presumption of innocence. That's the key phrase we're looking at. The presumption of innocence, again, has been obliterated here. We're not even taking that into account. You are literally innocent until proven guilty. You have that presumption of innocence. Not only have they not been proven guilty, they haven't had a trial, they haven't been sentenced, they haven't even committed the crime yet. Okay, so it's a massive, it's considered a massive infringement of human rights. Okay, which sets us up nicely for human rights. Um, but the reason why this is such a good body paragraph in a crime essay is because on the other side of that, because of the nature of the crime, terrorism, society is fine with it because it's almost like, yeah, we could be possibly infringing on their human rights um, because they could not, you know, be committing a crime and they could be completely innocent. It's not worth the risk, though. It's not it's not worth, you know, 10 people dying, 100 people, dying, whoever dies because of this one life that we, we are infringing on the human rights. It is up to you what your stance on that is, okay? I don't wanna sway you, but that's the issue here, okay? Nonetheless, things you need to talk about are all of those perspectives. 
and the presumption of innocence. I don't want to go on a tangent, but one thing I want to just quickly say, and I think I'll talk about it again when we get to essay writing, but um, I always get questions. I think there's a question that said something about how to write a band six essay. Band six essays are the ones that consider all perspectives involved. Victim, offender, society, okay? In every single body paragraph. You shouldn't have one body paragraph on preventative detention and how this is bad for the offender. You should have one body paragraph on preventative detention and how this is bad for the offender, but good for potential victims and great for society, okay? That's that complexity. That is what is characteristic of a band six essay, considering every single perspective and backing each perspective up with evidence. All right, hands down, that is what is the biggest thing that uh, band six students do. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, we'll return to this now. Um, oh, also that applies for all your essays and your, like your electives too. Um, like if you're doing family law, both of the uh, parents and the child as well, okay? If you're doing um, consumer law, the business, the government and consumers. If you're doing world order, the different governments and their citizens, okay? Every perspective, no matter what essay you do in um, legal studies. Okay, sorry, I know that was off topic, but I think that's really important. Okay, um, where were we? Yes, that's the issue of preventative detention. Continued detention, similar, um, but at least here we've proven that they've committed a crime. So continued detention is after you've finished your serving your sentence, you're kept in prison for an extended period of time because you're considered to be high risk, okay? The issue here is um, it's not so much presumption of innocence because we've already convicted them, so they've been found guilty, so we know they've committed the crime. The issue is it's still a human rights issue because they've served their time. And then you start to think, okay, well, where's the limit? They got told they were gonna serve, I don't know, 10 years in prison. Where, where's the limit? Where does it stop? At what, at what year do they actually get to be released? Okay, however, just like with preventative detention, it's protecting the community and it's protecting potential victims. So again, I'm not going to tell you what to think about that, but it's important that you have a judgment on that. Do you think it's worth it? Or do you think, no, that's actually unfair for these offenders. We should be releasing them. Um, it, the power to do this exists under the Crime Serious Sex Offenders Act 2006, New South Wales, because typically it's for sex offenders who we believe are high risk to um, re-offend again. So a good example, if I was doing a body paragraph on this, again, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, yes, this would be a great body paragraph. Kenneth Tillman was the first person to be detained after the expiration of his 10 year sentence for sexual assault. Okay, I'm just gonna have a quick sip. Okay, and that's an example of a case you could talk about. The Attorney General can apply to a court for continued detention if the offender is satisfied to a degree of probability, sorry, if the attorney general is satisfied to a degree of probability that the offender is likely to commit after, it's likely to commit another offense. Sorry, I must have been really tired while writing that. Yes, basically, um, the attorney general can basically continue the detention if we believe they're going to reoffend. To the allowable purposes of the continued detention are to ensure the safety and protection of the community, to facilitate the rehabilitation of serious sex offenders. Yes. All right. Crimes, High Risk Offenders Act 2013, New South Wales. Um, this is also for continued detention. This is for non-sex offenders, but just general high risk offenders. Um, a great one by, um, a great case to talk about here is Rebecca Butterfield, where her judge said that she's too violent to ever be let out again in society, okay? Because we believe they're gonna reoffend. Again, it protects safety, the safety of the community and victims. However, there are major justice issues. The individual has served their sentence. Law society, okay, which is a, um, almost like, the chief law um, or barrister group in Australia 
has deemed it unfair and unethical and we it's seen as re-punishing offenders for the same offense denies civil liberties so you're repunishing them over and over when they've already served their time okay which is a human rights issue okay sex offenders registration this is another thing you could talk about in an essay for crime um if you've committed any sexual offenses against a child you will be registered as a sex offender for eight years if you are a young offender when you commit the crime you'll be registered for four years now the whole point of this um, is not only to name and shame but also keep the public aware of dangerous sex offenders okay um police and and also sorry and also um employers and um, medical staff if need be anyone that might be endangered by a sexual offender um, police must be informed of the address any address change a change of name holidays that this person's going on in an attempt to protect the community um, it monitors the offenders so reoffending is minimized okay there's yeah continual monitoring monitoring of the offender there's a push to remove sexters from this, specifically young offenders. So um, we know that this is a big issue with young people um, sending illicit photos and messages to each other. Currently, if you're found, if you're found to be doing that, you'll be registered on the sex offenders list. There's a push to remove this um, them from the list though, and this is something you could talk about because this is a highly contentious issue, and this is something that's new. Um, which is something we love in legal studies. It's a new contentious, contentious issue. Jeez. Um, yeah, the reason why we want to kind of get it removed is because it's not, it's not kind of seen as predatory because oftentimes the teenagers or the young adults are the same age. Um, and a lot of time it's mostly, it mostly comes down to stupidity honestly um it's not really predatory as like there's a massive age gap or something like that most of the time if there is a major major age gap that's not what the push is about the push is about you know young teenagers young adults of the same age sending illicit um photos videos texts to each other um yeah and that's definitely something you could talk about okay next thing deportation so Deportation is the forcible removal of a person from a country and returning to a person to their country of origin. So if someone commits a crime here, they can either serve their sentence here and let's say they're from Chile, we send them back to Chile after they've served their sentence or they've um, committed the crime and we send them immediately back to Chile. This exists under the Migration Amendment Character and General Visa Cancellation Act 2014. Um, anyone who has served a, a jail sentence of 12 months or more in Australia can be de deported. Deportations are automatic. Some exemptions, we have some exemptions and the opportunity for the minister to intervene, specifically if this person has a family here and a life and, you know, is, has really integrated and assimilated into the Australian community. Um, the, the, they can apply to the minister to not deport them because they're, they're automatic. Um, the change had resulted in a 500% increase in the number of criminals deported. Again, this is highly contentious. Do you agree with deportation? Do you disagree? This is something you can talk about in an essay. Um, and there is, there are many cases you can find of um, a lot of, um, it, it seems to be happening to a lot of men. Um, I'm not I'm not sure if that's because men commit more crime or if it's, I have no idea. But Nonetheless, uh, you can find many cases of um, men kind of appealing to the minister to cancel the deportation because they have their whole family in Australia and they want to stay in Australia and there's no point going back to their home country. Um, yeah, and, and there are some that have been successful, some that have not been successful and actually a lot that have not been successful. That's up to you. Whether or not you think that's fair or not, that's up to you. Okay. Um, the Conventions on the Rights of the Child, which we'll learn about when we get to human rights, sets out the rights for all children and young people under 18 and informs our young offender law. Okay, We have international obligations to croc to protect our children. I would always mention that in a young offenders essay in the introduction that we have international obligations to the conventions of the rights of the child and therefore must protect 
young offenders or have a duty to protect young offenders. Um, Article 1 of uh, CROC states that anyone under 18 is a child, so we've adopted that. New South Wales law defines a child as a person who is under 16. In New South, in New South Wales, a young person a sorry, oh my gosh, I think it's because all the lectures I'm doing. Um, in New South Wales, a young person is aged 16 to 18. They are different to adults because, and this is important, in an introduction to a young offender essay, I would be stating this. I would say that we have international obligations to croc and must protect children, blah, 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 as I just said, and say the reason why, or the reasons for this, for these, for this protection is that children are not able to make wise judgments, are less experienced or inexperienced, are immature and more vulnerable to crime, vulnerable to being influenced, vulnerable to being hurt, all that kind of stuff, okay? I would provide some brief, don't go too much into it, maybe a sentence, actually I would say a sentence is enough, of just justifying why we need to treat young offenders differently. Is that a body paragraph you could talk about? Probably not, but as a marker, if I read that, I'm giving you ticks already. I'm, I'm really liking that. It's engaging me. It's pushing your mark up already. Okay, so we know based on research that young people become involved in crime because they have history of neglect, low levels of educational attainment, histories of sub substance abuse, and poor parental discipline or supervision. There are two different types of approaches to young offenders, and you could look at both of these in one body paragraph or two separate body paragraphs. We have the welfare model, which seeks to rehabilitate them. Again, as I said, look at those social factors that make someone or make a young offender want to commit crime. So everything we said here, childhood abuse, low education, no, unemployed, all that sort of stuff. Then we have the juvenile model, which as I said, is what we think of when we think of election time and we have a new possible new prime minister and we have new um, or we have new state representatives and we think of someone standing there on the news or wherever saying I'm gonna be tough on crime young offenders need to be imprisoned they need to suffer whatever that's what we think of okay I could quite easily make a body paragraph on each and talk about how I think the first one's more effective or ineffective and vice versa all right Children, Criminal Proceedings Act 1987, New South Wales. Hopefully we will remember that the common law presumption is Dolly Incapax, that a child in New South Wales under 10 is considered to be Dolly Incapax, meaning that they cannot, they do not have the consciousness to commit a crime, okay? They don't have the mens rea, that word, that phrase that we like to use. They don't have the mens rea to actually commit a crime. Um, that's... You can't deny that, okay? However, between the years of 12 and 13, sorry, 10 and 13, the presumption applies, but it can be challenged, okay? Um, it's presumed you are incapable of forming the relevant intent to commit a crime. So it still applies, but here it can be challenged. So you saw in the beginning, it was a conclusive presumption. Here, it's a legal presumption, meaning conclusive, meaning can't challenge it. Legal presumption, meaning you can. The prosecution must rebut the presumption of Dolly Incapax as an element of the prosecution case, okay? This was highlighted in R LMW 1999. Hopefully we all remember this case. It's a really big case. From the age of 14 to 17, the presumption of Dolly Incapax doesn't apply anymore, okay? At age 18, you become fully responsible and you're an adult now. However, people believe that we need law reform because we need to raise the age of what we consider a um, dolly incapax to stop applying. Um, for example, Amnesty International has campaigned raise the age, hashtag raise the age, following the Don Dale Royal Commission of the mistreatment of young offenders as young as 10 in detention centers. Okay, and the idea is if we raise, raise it from, let's say 10 to 14, we won't have 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds in detention centers anymore. So they can't get mistreated. All right, the rights of children when questioned or arrested. 
The law that details the rights of those when questioned or arrested is the Law Enforcement Powers and Responsibilities Act 2002, New South Wales, aka LEPRA, our famous LEPRA. Okay. When conducting an arrest, there must be the use of reasonable force. Okay. So you can't just, a police officer can't use extreme force against a child unnecessarily. It can, however, the police officer can, however, if the child is swinging and trying to hit the police officer, maybe like bear hug them and try to restrict them. They can't, you know, start hitting back or anything like that. Um, when conducting an arrest, there must be, yes, use of reasonable force, as I said. Police officer must also caution the young offender specifically on the right to silence. You must provide your name in situations of driving a car, under 18 drinking alcohol in a public space, sorry, not pace, suspected witness of a serious crime on public transport involved in a car accident. Yeah, um, this is a really good one because all the time you see like people driving or people on the train and saying, oh, I don't need to give you my name. You do need to give them your name. Um, yeah, under the law. Time limit of six hours questioning for a young offender, not including rest periods. We know though that they often make really long rest periods to try and tie you out and exhaust you and frustrate you into confessing. Okay. Um, yeah. So the police can hold you for six hours, but give you a break every hour for three hours. And therefore you're exhausted by the end and you can just confess even if you didn't actually commit the crime. Okay, you don't have to go to the police station unless you're arrested. You have the right to an independent adult, okay? Can't be a police officer, independent adult. Who can be a, per, a parent, a guardian, or a support person um, during the questioning time? And if you're over 14 years old, you can decide who the adult is. A confession can't be admitted into evidence without that support um, person with you. Legal aid will be provided without charge and merit means tests. Again, this comes back to what I was saying before. Because how vulnerable they are, they, they automatically get legal aid, okay? Because they're so young. You can't strip search under 10 years old. Children under 14 cannot be photographed or fingerprinted unless authorized by the children's court. No DNA samples if you're under 18 unless authorized by the children's court. R versus LMW 1999. Listen up, because this applies to so many different areas of young offender law. Um, and so you could use this for so much. So if we don't know, hopefully do, but just in case we don't, we had a 10 year old um, through, sorry, I must've been really tired when writing this because I'm not sure what I meant by, by through a six year old. 10 year old through a six year old who he knew couldn't swim into George's river where he drowned. Okay. Originally the case against him was dismissed, but there was enormous outrage in the media and the idea of a killer kid. Okay. Who should quote unquote suffer for what he's done. All right. The New South Wales DPP took the case of the Supreme court charging LMW with manslaughter. All right. The jury heard that LMW was immature for his age, more like an eight year old and found him not guilty in less than three hours. As evidence of that, something that LMW would do is he spoke about with like family members, um, waking um, Corey Davis, who he threw, his cousin who he threw, um, waking him back up, like almost like magic. And so we, we started to realize that he didn't actually understand the full intent of what he had done. He didn't actually understand he drowned him. Um, and he was, he was obviously very immature. So because of that, we found him not guilty. Okay. And the, K, the case study is represented in the Sydney Morning Herald article, Boy Cleared of Killing. Um, this is a seminal case. This is a really big case. I would definitely maybe just take a screenshot of this or jot it down or whatever, because yeah, this, this one's really important. Okay. Children's court act 1987. It's a specialized court established in 1987. Um, it deals with, and that's the legislation it exists under. Of course, it deals with juveniles aged 10 to 17, but also under 21. If the offense was committed before you turned 18, you must have legal representation. It's a closed court. Media is allowed, but they have to hide your identity. There's no jury, there's a specialist magistrate, and it's less adversarial as the young person is able to participate more and ask questions. This one I'm gonna breeze through because I wanna get back to um, 
the beefy stuff again. Um, it has jurisdiction over any offense committed by a child, except if it's a serious indictable offense that will go to the high court. Um, it has criminal, sorry, committal proceedings of any indictable offense where the accused is a child. For serious indictable offenses are held in, yeah, higher courts, such as the Matthew Millat and Corey Davis case. Uh, then the Supreme Court, as it was murder and manslaughter, can also be in the district court, as we saw in R vs. DS 2014. Um, traffic offenses are only heard before the children's court if the child was not old enough to hold a license. Otherwise, you appear in local court. All right. Youth Corey Court. This is another thing you could write a body paragraph on. So I would pay attention. Okay. So this is a children's court designed for Indigenous peoples. Okay. It is less adversarial, it is more um, informal, and it's more tailored towards, well, it is tailored towards the rehabilitation of the young Indigenous offender, okay? Um, it involves the family and the Aboriginal community. It involves more informal meetings. Um, you must plead guilty if you're going to um, uh, become, not become a part, but attend, sorry, that's the word I was looking for, attend the Youth Koori Court, um, sorry, the Koori Youth Court. If you're accepted into the program, the offender will attend a meeting known as the Youth Koori Court Conference, okay? Um, overwhelmingly, it has high rates of success, lower recidivism, higher satisfaction levels with victims, um, and better better outcomes for society because obviously there's reduced recidivism. I really want to emphasize that because this is definitely something you could talk about for young offenders, okay? Um, young offenders hasn't been directly asked in the HSC for years and years and years and years. So I'm not saying that it's definitely going to be asked, but it's looking good. So I would jot this down, okay? Um, the Koori Youth Court and specifically the Youth Koori Court Conference, um, definitely something I would talk about if I were you and it's how successful it's been. Um, the harshest penalty you can receive is a control order which is similar to imprisonment for an adult except that the young offender is held in custody in a juvenile detention centre can only be sentenced to a maximum of two years detention, okay, or three if you have many offences that you're being sentenced for. If you think that's a good thing, articulate that in your response. If you want to disagree and say that's a bad thing, articulate that. Um, the magistrate must give reasons why other punishments weren't used. So that comes back to the purposes of punishment and the justification. However, control orders have no specific deterrent effect because there is a high rate of recidivism. Um, no, I don't know why I wrote that. As I said, a low rate of recidivism. It's very successful. Um, in R versus GDP, the judge stressed rehabilitation. However, there are exceptions to this general rule where a young offender can be said to have adult behavior. Yes. But if I were you and I was talking about how effective it's been, this is a great case to use and to talk about the aims of the court. The judge stressed rehabilitation, not retribution. All right. Young Offenders Act 1997, New South Wales. Um, this is basically the different... Um, punishments you can receive, the different uh, penalties, sorry, you can receive as a young offender, okay? It, they exist under this piece of legislation. Um, so warning, cautions, youth justice conferences. There are divisionary programs, okay, which, are, which exist under the same piece of legislation and it's where you don't go to court and you don't have a conviction, but you go to a program that's tailored to rehabilitation. Um, it applies to summary offences and to some indictable offences, but not to serious offences such as robbery or sexual assault. Under the Act, young offenders proceed through a three-tiered system of divisionary processes. Okay, Divisionary programs are very, very successful as well. They um, promote high, low rates of recidivism. All right, we're going to breeze through this because hopefully we all remember this really well. We have warnings, cautions, youth justice conference. This is what I'm talking about with the low rates of recidivism for young offenders who attend this. Really effective. Um, it's it, recommended by police or by the court, okay? The aim of it is to keep young offenders out of the court. However, it's a bit ironic because the court 
can recommend young offenders to go here. So it's almost like, well, you're trying to keep them out of the court, but they have to go to the court first to get there. So there's a bit of conflict in the aim um, there. Um, there are for offences that are more serious or where there are no more cautions available. Like a caution, the young person must first admit to the offence, just like how we had in the Youth Curry Court. A juvenile justice Kavina, a representative from the police and the victim may attend. I'm um, sorry, I don't know why Kavina was so hard for me to pronounce. Um, it allows victims to say how they are affected by the crime. Yes, because the victim can stand up and tell the young offender how they were personally affected by the crime. Okay, now it's good because it's more uh, time efficient. It's much quicker than court. It's cost effective. It's not as effective as a children's, sorry, it's not as expensive as a children's court. It promotes high rates of victim satisfaction. There's 80% of victims said that they would recommend youth justice conferencing to other victims. There's high public support. 87% and these statistics are from Boxer. 87% um, of people agreed that the victim should have the chance to talk to the offender about how the crime affected them. Focuses on restorative justice and rehabilitation, which is good for the um, young offender, right? We want to rehabilitate them. So it seems as though it's good for the victim, society, the offender. Seems really effective. However, the ineffective, well, the ineffectiveness lies in its usage or administration. It's really good, but it's just simply underused. It's not used enough. Police do not give this to young offenders as an option, okay? Um, so more police discretion is needed pointing young offenders towards the YGC, YGC. We need more children there, okay, because we see that it's effective. This, again, definitely something you could write a body paragraph on, certainly. Um, however, not everyone agrees. Dr. Don Weatherburn from Boxar states that the YGC's YGC, I'm sorry, YJC, I don't know how many times I've said that, YJC is what I meant, doesn't address the underlying causes of juvenile offending. Okay, that's one perspective. You can agree, you can disagree. There was an alternative youth and drug alcohol court which provided counselling and rehab programs, but it was too expensive and it was axed in 2012. Nonetheless, I would definitely write about the YJC if I were in your position, or I would have it prepared. Okay, crimes against the international community now. Crimes committed by individuals and states which are seen as wrong by the international community. There are four different types of crimes against the international community. There's genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes of aggression, um, as kind of introduced in 2017. Sorry, I'm gonna have a sip of water. Okay. All right, Thomas Lubunga in 2012 was convicted for war crimes, um, specifically for children soldiers, having children soldiers, um, and crimes against humanity in the ICC, okay, International Criminal Court. Crimes of aggression recently was defined by the International Criminal Court as the use of force by one state against another, not justified by self-defense. Remember, in human rights and this is really important as we go into human rights we define um, a nation or a country as a state we refer to them as a state we don't refer to them as a nation or as a country we refer to them as a state so when you hear the use of force by one state against another we don't mean new south wales versus queensland we mean australia versus whatever country okay transnational crimes are different International crimes, sorry, crimes against the international community is a, a state or a person um, committing a crime that's at such a large scale, it's creating a threat to the entire international community. Transnational crimes are different in that they're not necessarily posing a threat to the entire national community. They're more so crimes that happen between states. So here we had Thomas Lubunga. He wasn't in Australia committing any crimes, but he posed threat to Australia because his crimes were of such a large scale. Transnational crimes will be crimes that happen in Australia, in Japan, in China, in USA, in England, wherever, okay? They're happening between countries. 
Um, these are usually slavery, drug trafficking, people trafficking, drug importation, um, stuff, yeah, child abuse images, weaponry trafficking or arms trafficking, money laundering, anything that can be done um, between states. This has gotten even more complex with um, the introduction of the internet and widespread um, internet use and social media because it's harder to control because you can talk to anyone at any um, in any country almost with you know within a few seconds the three main crimes though are drugs illicit arms trade and people trafficking transnational crimes are dealt with effectively at a domestic level by us not always by other countries um, you're not charged with a transnational crime necessarily you're not charged with committing you know for example if I'm trafficking drugs in Australia and the USA and Japan I'm not charged with that trafficking in Japan and the USA I'm only charged with trafficking in Australia for example slave trading is um, illegal under the criminal code section 270 Commonwealth um, it's a domestic offense while the transnational crime is human trafficking okay so slave trading compared to human trafficking Arbus Wei Tang is a great case to use for that I, if I was asked about international crime, I would definitely talk about Arvos Wei Tang 2008, okay? It was the first slavery conviction in Australia where she solicited 10 prostitutes from Thailand. Essentially, she told these um, innocent women in Thailand, you can come to Australia and work for me, I'll give you a house, I'll let you live here, whatever. They were like, all right, great, we'll come to Australia. When they came to Australia, she took their passports and basically forced them to work in a brothel for her. Um, without pay or without um, you know correct pay and without being able to freely move around and leave and all that kind of stuff so it's considered slavery which it is um, and under that act that we saw before she was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment we also have Arvis Dobby 2009 which was a Queensland hairdresser where we found um, Dobby was actually human uh, trafficking people um, it was the first case of human trafficking in New South Wales, um, and here's um, here's a uh, media article to if you're going to use that as evidence. All right, domestic measures responding to international crime. Um, international crime or transnational crime, just a little side note, hasn't been asked directly almost as long as young offenders i want to say or maybe maybe it was like a year before young offenders but nonetheless neither of these have been asked directly in a long time so i would be definitely jotting down things just a little side note all right domestic measures to international crime we have the australian federal police they're our number one okay they are investigating international crime and they are responding to it they don't just look within australia there they team up with other states remember i mean nations states they team up to investigate to go into other countries and help other armed forces for them to come into our country and help us um to mutually yeah mutually assist one another to tackle international crime the offender however will be prosecuted by domestic courts so court is another or common law is another domestic measure um, we also have the extradition of offenders where needed um, so it's a process whereby one country surrenders a suspect or convicted criminal to another um, to face criminal charges or sentencing okay um, under the extradition agreement a person who is believed to have committed a crime in australia can be detained in another country and deported to face legal proceedings in Australia, extradition is or extradition is covered by the Extradition Act 1998 Commonwealth. Australia has extradition treaties with about 130 countries. So if you do try to abscond or flee the country, you can just be handed back over to Australia in for some countries. Pretty sure I think I want to say Chile, we do not have an extradition treaty with, so I think a lot of criminals do end up fleeing there. Australia has ratified and enacted the Rome Statute 2002, which established the ICC. So this is an um, international measure. So before we look at domestic measures, Australian Federal Police, uh, statutory law and common law. Now we're looking at international measures, the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Um, 
essentially the International Criminal Court tries people who commit crimes against the international community, as we saw before. So it's a measure that's responding to it. Um, it was established by the Rome Statute, as I said. All crimes are listed in the Rome Statute, such as genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes of aggression. Um, as I said before, they're all listed in the Rome Statute. Um, the ICC can only prosecute a case where the domestic court can't or is not willing to do so. Yes, a question I get a lot is why don't we have many cases with Australians um, at the ICC? The ICC will basically respond to international crime where the country itself doesn't. So we see it responding to crime in a lot of developing nations um, because the country oftentimes won't. In Australia, though, we have solid interna uh, sorry, domestic measures which respond to that, um, which we've seen, right? We, we don't really need the ICC. Um, so an example of a tribunal um, that has been set up to respond to international crime is for the former Yugoslavia, which was established by the UN Security Council in 1993 via the resolution 827 the role was to prosecute individuals for war crimes crimes against humanity and genocide committed during the Yugoslavia conflict in 1990s and then we also have another one for rwanda that happened in 1994 under resolution 955 however both of them highly unsuccessful very costly not great international measures okay so if you want to talk about the um, international criminal tribunals that have been set up to try people who have committed crimes against the international community. That's definitely something to talk about, okay? Both of these um, have spent billions of dollars and have actually prosecuted and uh, convicted, right, because we want convictions, convicted very little people for how much money they've spent. The International Criminal Court um, was set up by the Rome Statue, as I said. It has ju jurisdiction to prosecute individuals who commit all those crimes. It is a court of last resort, okay? As I said, it's not trying to take over the power of states and come into Australia and say, oh, someone, you know, was convicted of slavery. We'll try them. Don't worry about Australia. We'll, we'll do it ourselves. There, if a country doesn't do it themselves. Um, can only prosecute cases when states are not willing to. The main responsibility is to investigate and prosecute these international crimes that lie within member states to the UN. The ICC can only exercise jurisdiction where the accused is a national of a member state of the treaty, okay? The alleged crime occurred in the territory of a member state. The situation is referred to the ICC by the UN Security Council. Where the ICC convicts an individual, it can impose a sentence of up to life imprisonment, not the death penalty. The court may order a fine or a forfeiture of assets and imprisonment. It's effective for victims, okay? It's usually not just one victim because we're talking about things like genocide here. Um, as it presents their views and observations before the court, there's some form of reparation um, for, for the suffering that's uh, occurred. There's a balance between retributive and restorative justice, which enables the ICC to bring just, bring criminals to justice and help victims rebuild their lives. All right, I hate to see is my code. All right, let's look at essay writing in legal studies. Essay writing in legal studies is actually quite simple. You do not need to make your writing sound too sophisticated with big words or complex uh, sentences. In fact, as your marker, if I was ever marking something, and when I do mark, you're, if it's too sophisticated and too complex, I start to drop you down marks because you start to lose me. Um, the sophistication in your writing will come down to your essay structure, paragraph structure, and how well you develop and support your argument. So it's more so about the structure of your writing and what you're actually writing about, more so than the words you use to write it. In legal, this is not English, I want you to tell me exactly how it is. Plain language, plain and simple, okay? Which is great. Um, so let's look at a few ways you can structure your essay. So you can do it by legal and non-legal responses. So you can do uh, paragraph one on legal, paragraph two on legal, paragraph three on um, legal as well, but in that look at non-legal responses. So both legal and non-legal. You can also do, oops, Legal, non-legal, legal. 
something like that. You can also do it by cases. I am not the biggest fan of this, to be honest, because I think if you look at it by cases, you're limiting yourself to only really one main piece of evidence, okay? Rather than by affected group or by a different part of the criminal justice system. Those are my two favorite, okay? Um, by affected group, I believe that you should look at the affected group in every single paragraph or three. My favorite is to look at a part of the syllabus in each body paragraph. So one body paragraph on preventative detention, like I said before. Another on continued detention, uh, detention and another one on protective custody, okay, and security considerations. Different areas of the syllabus and talk about all three of these affected groups, non-legal and legal responses, cases, um, and their effectiveness, okay? All right, this is my paragraph structure. Um, this is how I would um, introduce, or this is my introduction structure. My first sentence is my judgment and my response to, question, to the question. In legal studies, you should always be rewording the question back to the marker with your own judgment in it. So let's, I, let's say I was asked, to what extent is a criminal, or something really simple, uh, to what extent does a criminal trial process achieve justice? Okay, this is my response. Overarchingly, the criminal trial process is limited in its effectiveness of achieving justice. Real simple, real plain, I just reworded it, I gave you, I gave you that, um, criteria and judgment already, okay? I'm not gonna read through all of this, but my second sentence, I elaborate on the judgment and introduce the criteria that will be used to form judgments on arguments. So I'll read this one, but not the rest. Um, while there are areas of extreme effectiveness, there are many limitations of the criminal trial process. Such areas can be measured by their ability to not only balance the rights of victims, society and offenders, and reflect societal morals and ethical standards. So. I'm saying the criteria I'm going to use to actually make a judgment on this is the ability of the law to both balance the rights of victims, society and offenders and reflect societal, moral and ethical standards. OK, then I introduce my arguments and then I reinstate effectively what I set up here. Really simple. Um, then my paragraph structure is where I first state my judgment for my individual argument. I elaborate on my argument and the best way to do this is to introduce the relevant legislation. So if I say, if I'm talking about, I'm not sure, mitigating aggra aggravating factors, I could talk about the Sentencing Procedures Act and say something like, uh, mitigating aggravating factors are regulated under the Sentencing Procedures Act 1999, okay? That's a really nice way to introduce my first piece of evidence. I haven't really even done anything, I already have evidence. Then I argue different perspectives. Remember, that's what really makes me a, makes me have a band six essay through my evidence. So I look at one perspective and how it impacts them, the other and the third person um, through different evidence. Then I state my overall judgment on the argument again, considering all perspectives, and I repeat my overall judgment. This is if it's a law reform essay. Um, you have a different structure to normal. Firstly, you state your judgment on overall law reform. Then you introduce the need or conditions for law reform and any agencies possible. So why did we actually need law reform? What was happening in the world? Then you support these conditions with um, different evidence. Then you introduce law reform and begin to evaluate how effective the law reform has been. Okay, through different pieces of evidence again, looking at different perspectives. Then we state our overall judgment on law reform, considering all the perspectives and repeat the judgment. Okay, so the conclusion needs to be straight, um, short and straight to the point, needs to have three to four sentences max, needs to include a summary of the points you discussed in your essay, you shouldn't recount every point, and it must address the question by looking again at your argument or thesis. Okay, we're not gonna look at this entire paragraph um, bit by bit. Again, I would suggest downloading the slides and looking at this exemplar paragraph, but we will read this first sentence. Deportation as a post-sentencing consideration is largely ineffective in maintaining a balance of justice for the community and victim's safety and interest, as well as the rights of the accused. What did I do there? I stated the overall judgment 
um, aligned with the question that was being asked and my thesis. The question was about the ability of post-sentencing considerations in balancing the rights of those three parties. Okay, so you can see how I've aligned it with the question and my overall judgment um, for the entire essay. The second sentence, oh, starting from this sentence, sorry, I forgot to highlight that sentence as well, provides brief background on deportation and articulates criteria being used to inform judgment, okay? I'm, re, I'm reminding my marker about this criteria I'm using, okay? So already pushing myself up toward a band six. Then here I'm looking at different perspectives, okay? Using different types of evidence. So offenders rights, um, I'm talking about their community. I'm talking about here. Um, well, actually I did not write this body paragraph, but this, this student, um, and they also talk about the victim, but I cannot see where that is, but nonetheless, yeah, victims, you can see there's that balance of looking at different perspectives. Then, reinforcing my judgment and relating it back to the question and thesis. All right, cool. So now this is what I really wanted to do. This is the interactive stuff. If we were asked this question, I want us to kind of make a bit of an essay plan. What I mean by that is jot down for me three body paragraphs that you would use to respond to this question. So you can literally, you don't have to write your evidence or anything, just write, Body paragraph one would be this, body paragraph two would be this, body paragraph three would be this. Um, uh, how, sorry, I'm just going to activate the poll. Okay, open text. I hope this works. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Okay, hopefully that works now. All right. So the question is, explain the tension between community interests and individual rights and freedoms within the criminal justice system. So jot down for me what your three body paragraphs would talk about if you were asked this question. If you want to, if you feel confident enough, write in parentheses next to them what your overall judgment would be. Would you say this body paragraph would be effective, this body paragraph ineffective? If you don't understand what I'm talking about, what I'm asking you to do, um, just jot down or just maybe ask me a question and say, I don't understand. Um, I think I already answered this, where will this PowerPoint be available? But someone's just asked again, um, where resources below my video, literally below my head, um, you see resources and it says slides. Okay. Oh, hopefully. Wait, I don't know if that helps. Can you type? Yes, you can type an answer. Sorry, I can't. Okay, cool. I see some answers. Cool. Someone said bail, juries, police powers. Nice. What would you say? Would you say bail is effective, bail is ineffective, moderately effective, juries, police powers? What, do, what would we say? I don't know if you can edit your response, but maybe resubmit and let me know. Okay, criminal investigation process, bail remand, bail Drew's police powers, defenses to a crime moderate, okay, people still typing, maybe having a bit of a think. This, while, while you're writing that, I'll just let you know, this is what you want to be doing when you're studying. This is one study technique, okay? Put up a question in front of you and say, what would my three body paragraphs be? What would my evidence be for this body paragraph, for this body paragraph, for this body paragraph? That way you're doing a few things. You're memorizing your evidence. You're seeing from what you already have, all the notes you already have, how you can apply it to a real question. And you're learning the ways of a question and learning the ways they like to frame questions. Okay. Role of victims in sentencing. Yes, definitely. Bail, juries, police power. Okay, so um, bail remand, police powers. Okay, so what would you say for police powers? Can anyone tell me? Would you say police powers are effective, ineffective? There's no right answer. It's dependent on your um, judgment. 
Apologies, only in year 10 going to year 11 and failing new students. That's completely fine. It's completely fine. Um, police, okay. Abusive police powers, parole, nice. Bail and remand. Okay, cool. So the, the big consensus seems to be police powers, bail. And yeah, those seem to be the two ones. Police powers achieves minimal justice as they exceed the idea of tough on crime. Nice. Okay. Someone said, paragraph one, terrorism, police powers, infringement of individual human rights, protecting community. Okay. So you look at both of those. What would your overall judgment be? Bail and parole. There's a high risk of reoffending and flight risks, not in community interest safety. Good. So I'm guessing you're going to say ineffective. Oh no, it just went. Oh no. Mandatory sentencing, good guidelines for judges and community, however, do not consider mitigating and aggravating factors in sentencing. Okay, so it's not a guideline for the judges. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's mandatory. They must agree to it. Um, but it's, it is good for community and victims, yes. Um, good, Roberto Curdy, that's good. That's really, really good. Okay, cool. I might stop that. Now I'm going to stop that, but well done. I was pleasantly surprised about how well we did with that. Um, I see a person's typing. I'm so sorry. I have to stop now, but you will be able to do um, the next one, which is this, um, which I'm going to activate now. Sorry, I originally did it as a word cloud, and I realized that that's probably not the best way to do this. So Hopefully that's live now. Question is, to what extent are courts the only means of achieving justice within the criminal justice system? So we're asked about courts and them being the only means of achieving justice within the criminal justice system. What would we say for this? What would our three body paragraphs be? Any ideas? It's also delayed, as I said. So um, I'm, I'm just going to have to wait a little while. How's Q&A going? This is something that someone, sorry, I'm just reading the Q&A. This is something that someone also said for my English Standard Lecture. They said, what if your teacher doesn't give feedback? Firstly, I am so sorry because that's awful if your teacher doesn't give you feedback because it's their job and their role too. Um, if they don't, I would suggest doing what I did. Um, I did this not because my teacher wouldn't give me feedback, but because it's always good, even if your teacher does give you feedback, to get other people's opinions as well. Um, I would upload my essays on ATAR Notes or um, any kind of online forum. Uh, there's another one that's my mind is failing on me. If anyone knows it, put it in the Q&A and I'll say it. There's another kind of forum website, but Eitan Notes has a forum website. I'd post it there and ask for some feedback from everyone. And people would um, people would help me and give me feedback and give me ideas. I would also ask my other friends in legal studies. Um, but yeah, the forum one was definitely something that really helped me, especially because there were graduates, new graduates that had achieved band sixes that helped me, but also my peers. Um, what is LCMDI? Uh, legislation, cases, media. Um, I don't know what the D, I'm forgetting what the D stands for, but also statistics. Um, yeah, different um, pieces of evidence that you can have. How are we going with the... Okay, Youth Curry Court, absolutely you could talk about that and how for young offenders in particular, um, or Indigenous young offenders, courts, traditional court, the children court isn't the only means of achieving justice also you could talk about the youth justice conferencing um alternative dispute um okay so adr is usually for civil matters or for family law okay so it's not really for criminal law for criminal law we're looking more at courts or divisionary programs or the ygc sorry i keep doing that yjc gosh um not really adr um courts are a vehicle for law reform yep circle sentencing good um 
Okay, someone said media is a means of achieving justice. I think that's what you mean. So I get what you're trying to say. However, media can't actually make justice happen. They can pressure different institutions to make justice happen, but they're not really um, making justice happen themselves. Like they can't change the law, create law. Circle sentencing, good. Um, good, good. Okay, cool. All right. Um, we have a few, but I'm going to skip past to exam skills now. And if we have time, we can go back or do the q and I'll probably do the Q&A. But if you want some study resources, come back to these slides, take a screenshot, download them, whatever, and do exactly what we've just done together, but by yourselves. Okay, so exam skills. Um, these are my tips. Establish a, a game plan as you study more of your units. Um, so as you go through from crime to human rights to family, consumer, world order, shelter, etc., whatever you study. How are you going to approach the exam paper? Are you going to go from multiple choice to short answer to crime to your electives? Or do you want to get your electives over and done with first? Okay, completely up to you. Most important thing is to, um, sorry, let me just stop that poll. Oh gosh, I can't stop the poll. It disappeared. Oh no, there it is. Um, the most important thing is to actually have a game plan. Stay on top of your notes, okay? I don't just mean notes, as I said, for human rights. I mean those flashcard type things that I would suggest for you to make. Stay on top of them because in legal studies, you do not have time to play catch up simply because of how much memorizing you have to do, okay? I know I said this before, but seriously, if there's one thing you get from today's lecture, stay on top of your notes. So if you haven't finalized all your crime notes, and human rights if you've started to do human rights take this time left in your holidays to do so um speaking of notes i think the best way for you to make notes for your units not unites that requires essays by making essay plans only yeah don't bother with every with notes on every point in syllabus cool we already spoke about that start doing practice writing this hands down was one of the main reasons i was able to get a band six in legal studies so this is what I mean by the essay plans, right? We've spoken about this criminal trial process. These would be my three body paragraphs. These are all my evidences for the body paragraphs. Okay, cool. So we have 10 minutes left. So let's go back then and do another one because those were good. And I think they were good practice. Let's do this because this hasn't been asked in a, a little while um, for in, in the HSC. So I really want to see if we can pull some stuff um, to talk about here. So I'm going to activate it. Tell me, guys, what would you write about if this was your question? How effective are domestic and international measures in dealing with transnational crime? What would we say? And keep writing Q&As because we are um we're going to i'm going to be able to answer some okay um i think it's a little bit delayed yeah four people are typing cool okay while you guys Oh, D's documents. Thank you. The LCMDI D's documents. Thank you for whoever um, said that. Board of Studies. Yes, the forum. Thank you so much to whoever said that too. Uh, clearly, it is getting too late for me or something. I'm just, uh, my brain's not working anymore. Board of Studies is the other forum you can post your um, essays on and get feedback. And I would say to do it on both. Maximize the amount of feedback you can get. Um, okay, we still have some people typing. What, what could we talk about? What are some domestic measures? We spoke about them. Okay, federal police, UN conventions um, and their success of them. Um, some people rectifying somewhat. So some people have um, actually ratified them i think that's what you mean and um australia enacting remember for human rights uh, most countries only need to ratify a treaty for it to become a part of their domestic law we need to ratify and enact okay 
So for most states, not countries, states, there's two steps or really, yeah, sign and then ratify for them. For us, three, sign, ratify and act. Australian Federal Police Law Enforcement Agency is able to join with other enforcement agencies from different states, good, to help attack transnational crime. Good. See, that's really good. That's something else we could talk about. What else, guys? What about some international measures? Maybe some that we didn't go through today. Um, let me see how the Q&A is doing. Um, okay. I think I've done... Sorry, I'm just trying to go through and see what questions I haven't answered. Best strategy for making legal notes. Oh, okay. Hopefully I answered that for you and told you essay plans is the way to go about it. Yeah, don't write down everything you learn. Only write down what you think you could make a body paragraph about. Um, okay, before sitting exams, I feel like I know my content, but when it comes to writing the essay, I feel like I don't have enough info. That is a common struggle. The reason why it feels like that, and keep writing the response to this, guys, but I'm just going to answer while I do this. The reason why it feels like that a lot of the time is because you go through so much unnecessary content, especially for crime in your electives. You go through so much and you, you take it all in, but you get to the question on the page and you think, okay, how do I actually apply it? I was never actually taught how to write paragraphs about this. That's why I'm saying skip the note taking about every single thing only look at the content and think okay where can i make body paragraphs where can i find my evidence okay cool and only really study that um because that's all you're ever going to be asked about you, never in an elective you're not going to turn to you know the 25 marker and suddenly it's all different three marks two marks four marks on short answer questions about the insignificant stuff it's all going to be a 25 marker on the big picture stuff and the essay writing um, struggling currently with human rights, any tips on successfully studying for it? Um, yeah, actually I did respond to that. I'm pretty sure I said the multiple choice stuff. Okay. Geneva convention is generally effective. However, however, a limitation comes where some countries are not part of it. Good. UN good domestic law, somewhat effective can be hard to gather evidence to support the case, which has occurred across the border. However, the decisions made are legally binding within the state. Yep. Um, and also highly responsive, um, which is something we don't see in other nations. International law, largely ineffective. Countries much, must ratify and enact them for, be effect for them to be effective. And another thing is that countries must actually um, enforce them. So we see a lot of countries ratify and in places like Australia ratify and enact, but they don't actually even um, kind of keep their own law so things like the iccpr have been ratified in china but china still uses the death penalty um, and you can see that that's a clear breach of international law okay so it's not just just because it's ratified in a nation doesn't mean it's actually being in, a for, enforced and complied to um, but good um ig say good uh, sorry i icj gosh uh Body paragraph one, federal and state police, police, good. And then you have Interpol. Um, maybe they're like cooperation with Interpol, I think you might mean, which is good. That's really good. Body paragraph two, international agencies, and institutions. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, parliament is body paragraph three. So legislation, that's good. Um, our statutory law. All right, cool. So. In our last three minutes, I'm going to read some of your Q&A. Oh, oh, my gosh. We'll keep. Oh, my gosh. I'm at the end now. Is there a way to. All right. I'm just going to skip through while I go through this Q&A. Um, all right. You know what? I'll just leave it there. <laughs> it's going to take me forever to get to the end of our slides. No, it won't. Oh, my gosh. OK. Don't worry, guys. We're just um, we're just going to look at this page in PowerPoint. We're not going to actually look at it full screen. Okay. So, um, let's see your questions that you've been asking. Does evidence of legal studies only have to be from New South Wales or it can be other countries and states? Depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about, a, I don't know, preventative detention, 
try to keep it to New South, New South Wales. If you're talking about young offenders, New South Wales. But obviously, if it's international crime, obviously international um, can can work. Um, yeah. Can you show us your legal essay plans? I don't have them with me today, um, but effectively, it's literally this. This is how it was formatted for different for every single dot point in crime and my electives. Um, is it okay to download and use other people's band six notes or should you make your own? Make your own. Um, I see it time and time again with so many of my students. Just because you have someone's notes doesn't mean you actually understand what they wrote about. And plus, you what you write about for a dot point is tailored to what you feel most confident in. For example, we saw it with everyone's responses to those essay plans that we just did. Everyone said different things depending on what they're most confident in. So what you know someone is going to be confident in doesn't mean you're also going to be confident in that so you really need to tailor it to what you can talk about um uh any advice for students whose teachers go rather slowly through content my teacher is still on cet for criminal trial processing crime she grows through it thoroughly but so slowly skip ahead Go through it on your own terms. Um, unfortunately, in class, I'm not sure if you'll be able to skip ahead, but at home in your own study, you can start skipping ahead. Um, if you upload your essay on a forum website, would it potentially get scanned for plagiarism? Um, yes, if it was something that you're submitting as an assessment. So the essays that I wrote and uploaded on a forum website, that would be practice essays. Don't submit something you're gonna submit like on Google Classroom or turn it in. Um, yeah, don't do, don't do that. But as practice essays for the people whose teachers don't give them feedback and for everyone in general, posting on a forum website will be fine. Um, someone else might get scanned for plagiarism if they try and plagiarize you though. Um, how can you self-mark answers? Um, do you have a criteria? Do you have different, have you explored different um, perspectives? And have you maintained a criteria or throughout a judgment? How much do you have at least five pieces of evidence per body paragraph, five different types of evidence, so not just all cases, not just all media articles. But in saying that, I know it's tricky, so that's why I would definitely um, try and get feedback from other people if you can. Um, is there a way we can access the legal lecture from September 22 and this one after today? Yeah, so that one I also did um, in September 2022. You can on the ATAR Notes websites. Um, just look up ATAR Notes um, lecture recording in, on Google and you will be able to find it shortly. Um, okay, I'm going to quickly wrap this up. When do you think we should start writing our practice essays to use in the HSC? Immediately, if you can. Obviously, you can't, for example, if you're doing family law as one of your electives, you can't start writing it now. Do what you can as soon as you can. So if you finish crime, start writing your crime essays gradually okay don't write full essays but definitely write maybe body paragraphs and intros and get feedback on that um okay what's a good amount to study a day in total a day probably like an hour hour and a half two hours um that's in term when you're actually in the term um in a week is probably better probably around six to eight hours a week how to be motivated to study and how to make study fun. Um, this is something I spoke about in my English Standard Lecture. So if you're coming from an English Standard Lecture, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself here. But something that I did that made study fun was go to a library or go, yeah, library is probably the best place, not someone's house because you're more likely to just talk and, you know, have fun. Go to a library, library with my friends, uh, meet up and study together because as soon as you walk into the library, you see everyone else studying and it's kind of like, all right, study mode. I also would FaceTime my friend and put her on mute and she would put me on, or we'd mute ourselves, I mean to say, and we would study. And I would see her study and I would think, oh, okay, shoot, if she's studying, I must need to study because I must be behind. And it kind of forced me to go into gear and start studying. I know that's not necessarily the most fun, but it definitely motivated me to study. All right, I'll do two more questions. Um, I always override have too much information for essays, uh, but otherwise I feel like I don't provide enough. How do I know when I have enough quality info? 
feedback. But also another thing that I would do is ideally you should be writing a body paragraph in around eight minutes. Set an eight minute timer, write as much as you can. Stop when the eight minutes is up. Look at your writing and see. Okay, I don't need that. All right, that shouldn't, I shouldn't have written here. This, I should have said this more. I should have went on about this a bit more. And you can start to omit things and start to include more things. The biggest thing I would say people lack is not having a criteria that they're um, referring to over and over again and not repeating their judgment by looking at different perspectives. Um, okay, other thing. Um, is it possible to bounce back from a bad year 11 experience in terms of results and habits? I'm trying to because I have a high ATAR goal, but many worries. Yes, I did not do as well as I did in year 11 legal studies as I wanted to. And I remember feeling very defeated. So absolutely you can. Absolutely you can. Um, take it from me. I really was not that... Um, happy with my result at the end of year 11, but then I got a band six in year 12. So you certainly are able to. All right. Thank you for joining today's lecture, guys. I hope you learned at least one thing. Um, we're going to be having plenty of more lectures at ATOR Notes throughout the year, so keep an eye out for that. And we'll be covering different areas, moving on from crime, more into human rights and your electives. Thank you so much. I hope I see you next time.